Hello again and welcome back. During the morning, we heard relevant speakers sharing their knowledge and ideas on the digital transformation in justice. What happened for the last two decades, what we need to do. Next presentations and talks will also address the challenges the judicial system faces in digitalization processes. And we are starting with uh, Richard Suskind, author, speaker and uh, independent advisor. Online courts and the future of justice brings a transformative view on the future of legal services and how litigation is being transformed by technology. After the presentation, we will have the opportunity to take some questions from uh, the, the audience that is uh, joining us live all across Europe. Uh, you can place uh, your questions in the chat window, uh, chat window on the right side of your screen. For now, uh, good morning or good afternoon, if it's the case, Mr. Richard Suskind, the floor is yours and welcome. It is indeed good morning. Good morning to everyone. It's a great pleasure and honor to be with you. And I'm here to talk to you today about online courts and the future of justice. And I thought we should do this by looking at six different subjects. I want to outline what I think the problem facing our system is, all our systems, discuss the mindset I think you might usefully have in thinking about the future of our courts, reflect on the tragedy that has been COVID-19 and how it's affected are thinking about courts, say a little about technology, how it's affecting our lives generally, and so will inevitably have an effect on the working of the courts, and then suggest to you what I think will be the main features of court systems in the future. And finally, I want to reflect on justice and how the systems I and others are recommending will help promote justice and the problems that might arise. So let me start with the problem we face. In fact, we play, face three problems. First of all, our hearing rooms around the world have been closed, are closed because of the, the awful virus. Secondly, large backlogs have been building up in our court systems. And thirdly, and this is a long-standing problem, we call it the access to justice problem, that even in our most advanced legal systems, most, say, civil disputes cost too much take too long, the process is too combative, and the process is also not understandable unless you're a lawyer. And all of this, I believe, is out of step in a digital society. And in some countries around the world that are staggering backlogs, for example, in the court system of Brazil, a backlog of 80 million cases, and in India, a backlog of 30 million cases. The most, I think, worrying statistic of all comes from the OECD, who have suggested that only 46% of human beings on our planet live under the protection of the law. That's less than half of the people in our world have realistic access to lawyers and courts. So how do we tackle this problem? What mindset should we have in thinking about the future of our courts? The fundamental question I ask and it's a question I've been asking for about 30 years, is this. Is court a service or a place? Do we really need physically to congregate, to come together in one place to sort out all our legal differences? Or might in a digital world, there be new ways, technology enabled ways of resolving legal disputes? The mindset I think you need to have is well illustrated by one of my favorite stories about one of the world's leading manufacturers of power tools known as Black & Decker. And apparently when they recruit new executives, they take them off on a course, sit them down in a room and put up a slide, a slide of a gleaming power drill. And they say to the assembled new executives, this is what we sell, isn't it? And they all agree. They say, of course, that's what we sell. We're Black & Decker. But then the trainers put up a further slide and it's a picture of a hole neatly drilled in a piece of wood. They say that's actually what we sell because that's really what our customers want. And it's your job to find ever more creative, competitive, imaginative ways of giving our customers what they want. And I think there's a great lesson here for everyone who's thinking about the future of the court system. 
We need to think not so much about the power drill, making it quicker, cheaper or lighter, how we do things today. We need to take a step back and think about the hole in the wall. What's the fundamental value we bring to those we serve in delivering a court service? And might that value in a digital society be delivered in new ways? And in terms of technology, we need to have a different mindset there too. For years, for 60 years of legal and court technology, we have been dominated by automation. And the idea there is that the role of technology is to make our current processes more efficient. But the real excitement for me, and I hope for you, should be in innovation. How to use technology to allow us to do things that previously weren't possible. Not just a question of streamlining and optimizing our current sources, court system, not a question of grafting our technology onto our existing ways of working, but using the power of technology, the reach of the internet, the power again of mobile technology to allow us to deliver court services in new ways. So that's the mindset. What about COVID-19? Well, we've seen over the last year or so remarkable developments and changes in our courts. We've been forced to. Have a look at the website www.remotecourts.org. That's a website called Remote Courts Worldwide, and I've been heavily involved with it. We've been tracking the developments around the world where countries have chosen to move from physical court hearings to remote hearings. We now have 168 countries represented, and we hear news of audio hearings, hearings by telephone conference. We hear news of paper hearings, where there's no hearings at all. Evidence and arguments are submitted on paper, uh, like an exchange of email messages, and the judge responds in kind. And we hear, of course, and it's been the most successful technology over the last year, of video hearings. I want to make five observations about video hearings. First of all, they actually, for many cases, work quite well and much, much better than most lawyers and judges would have said at the beginning of last year. Most lawyers and judges would have said that video hearings hardly work at all or not suitable. And I'm not saying they're suitable for all cases, but for many cases, they have kept our justice systems alive. They've kept the rule of law alive. They've maintained access to justice. A second observation is that judges and lawyers can actually adapt quickly. Many people say that judges and lawyers are very conservative. They never change. But in fact, when the platform was burning, when the iceberg was melting, judges and lawyers did indeed change and have embraced remote hearings. And so over this past year, many minds have been opened, minds that just a year ago that would have rejected alternatives to physical court systems have been opened. And indeed, some minds have even been changed. However, I am finding around the world as I travel virtually, I'm hearing essentially two polarized responses to the idea of carrying on with video hearings. Some people say they cannot wait to go back to the old ways of working. And other people say we should never go back to the old ways of working. And there's not many people in between. So we need public debate about what aspects of what has worked well should be kept and industrialized and what frankly has not worked so well and requires still the use of traditional courts. Many people say to me, that COVID-19 has accelerated technological change. Yes and no. What it's done, no doubt, is accelerated technologies that help us communicate and collaborate and cooperate. And so the very technology we're using today, the video technology that we are using, has of course been embraced far more widely. But many more advanced technologies like artificial intelligence have in fact been put on the back burner. They've been put on hold over the past year as we've just tried to keep our systems afloat. So I think COVID has both accelerated and decelerated technological change. It has accelerated automation, but decelerated innovation. 
But let's be very clear, the future has not yet arrived. Home working is not a full transformation in courts. Dropping hearings into Zoom or Teams is not a shift in paradigm. The people, the rules, the processes, and the problems I mentioned are still very much the same. COVID, I think, is best looked upon in this context like an experiment, an experiment in the use of video hearings and other technologies that help us communicate in new ways. And we must gather data, as I say, about what's working well and what's not working well. But we shouldn't think that video hearings are the final step in the transformation of the courts. In fact, I think we are still at the foothills. We're still at the beginning of change. COVID-19 offers a springboard to a new way of working, but I think we still need to go back to the drawing board. So what does the future actually look like? Well, I've laid this out, or my version of the future, in a book that I wrote called Online Courts and the Future of Justice. It was published in November 2019, several months before the crisis. It was not really about video courts, though. It painted a different picture. And this is the picture I want to discuss with you today. But let me first of all say just a little about technology, because technology itself is fascinating. We live in an era, I believe, of what I call increasingly capable systems. Hardly a day goes by that we don't hear news about some new technology or system or app or breakthrough. These technologies are emerging at an accelerating rate. And many of these systems are taking on tasks that previously we thought could only be undertaken by human beings. And so we're seeing immense progress in a whole variety of technology. And the important thing to notice here is there is no finishing line. No one in Silicon Valley, no one in South Korea, no one in China is saying, well, that's the technology revolution finished. Let's stop for a while or let's plateau. Quite the contrary, the pace of change is accelerating. And isn't it amazing that more people now have access to the internet in our world than have access to justice? 59% of people are now online in our world. And yet, as I mentioned, according to the OECD, only 46% of people have access to justice. As lawyers, as policymakers, as politicians, we should be collectively ashamed by these statistics. We need to work much harder in making justice more widely available. And ladies and gentlemen, the answer here is not to automate. It's not simply to use technology to speed up and improve what we have always done. If our systems are disproportionate, our court systems, they're disproportionate whoever is paying. We need entirely different ways, it seems to me, of offering access to justice. And in the remainder of my presentation, in the second half, what I want to do is lay out the road ahead. And I think there are five elements to the future of our court system, and I want to discuss each in turn. But let me give you the helicopter view. We will have what I call, firstly, asynchronous online judging. I will explain the term. Secondly, we'll have what I call extended court services. Thirdly, we'll have front ends to our court services. Fourthly, we'll embrace and deploy artificial intelligence. And fifthly, we will invest also in dispute avoidance. So let's look at each of these five in turns. The asynchronous hearing, first of all, well, that's a scary term. Communication is synchronous when the people communicating have to be available at the same time. If you think of the phone call, the video call, the meeting, for the communication to take place, everyone has to be available. But then there is asynchronous communication, electronic mail, WhatsApp, text messages, where you can communicate, 
but you don't need to be available at the same time. You communicate at your convenience. Now, judging has always been a synchronous process. Everyone assembles together at the same time physically, and at the same time, the process takes place. What I'm calling for is online judging, a form of asynchronous process, not for all cases, but for many cases, and particularly for the high volume, low value cases that are clogging up so many of our court systems around the world. And I'm calling for an online asynchronous judging process. Still human judges, but what happens is the parties submit their evidence and arguments online as a form of almost email exchange. There's a conversation online, not in real time, but again, an exchange of messages, and the judge delivers his or her decision, determination in the same way. In this way, no one needs to take a day off work. Judges and parties can engage at their convenience. It's quicker, it's cheaper, and it's a more proportionate way of addressing many low-cost, high-volume issues. So that is the idea of online judging as an asynchronous process. The second idea I have is more radical. That's what I call the extended court service. It worries me that most discussions of access to justice are about better access to dispute resolution. But my problem is that it's not just enough to make our courts available. We need to equip people to appear in courts. And so we need tools to help them understand their legal position, tools to help them understand what options are available to them, tools to help them organize and present their evidence and arguments. We should have online tools to help parties negotiate as a form of non-judicial settlement. And all of these facilities I call the extended court service, and I believe in a digital society, these should not be a private sector alternative at least in some cases, they should be part of the court service. The primary court service, of course, is judicial determination. But if our courts are going to be genuinely accessible, we need to extend these services for people who represent themselves. And in a world where there's less public funding, more and more people will represent themselves or else they'll have no access to justice at all. We want to encourage people to avoid their disputes, to contain their disputes. We need to give people the tools as part of the court system to help them appear in the court system. And this is not a fantasy. We see it in the Civil Resolution Tribunal in British Columbia. We even see it in eBay. Over 60 million, yes, 60 million disputes every year on eBay almost all of which are sorted out by an online dispute resolution process. And then there are the front ends, the third idea. I accept that not all courts will be able to extend, particularly post-COVID, extend their services in the way I suggest. And so I have another idea, which is a front end or a plug-in, a public-private sector collaboration where we provide these extended services not within the court system, but connected to the court system. It provides a facility before people be appear before a judge that allows us to divert some cases away from the judge or indeed dissolve cases altogether. Again, tools to help people understand their rights, the options available to them, tools that help them prepare their arguments. We have these as front ends to court systems. And under Law Tech UK, we're doing, um, a great deal of work in this area, looking at the viability of this, particularly for small and medium-sized businesses. Fourthly, there's artificial intelligence. I wrote my PhD in Oxford in artificial intelligence in the 1980s. So this is a subject very close to my heart. And artificial intelligence is relevant for tomorrow's courts in three ways. First of all, it will be a form of AI that will provide the online legal guidance that people will need. Secondly, it'll be a form of online AI that helps people understand or evaluate whether or not 
their case is likely to succeed. We have systems now that can help predict the outcome of disputes, and these systems can be used in support of early resolutions. But the very interesting question that I've been working on for 40 years is this. Could computers ever replace judges? Well, if your question or that question is, can computers think and reason and provide decisions with explanations like judges, the answer for many decades yet is no. But is there another use of AI to provide determinations? Well, there is a possibility, and I call this predictions as determinations. There's a system, for example, that's much talked about in the United States called Lex Machina. And it is said to be able to predict the outcome of patent disputes there more accurately than any human lawyers. It does so on the basis of computational statistics. It has hundreds of thousands of past cases, information about these cases, who the judge was, who the law firm was, the nature of the claim, the size of the claim, the name of the party. It appears that if you have enough past information about particular types of court cases, then there is a technology that can predict the outcome of cases to a very high standard. That's the kind of system that will be used in helping people decide whether or not they can or they should proceed before a judge. Because if you know that your case has only 1% of proceeding, you may quite sensibly decide not to go ahead. That's the kind of guidance a lawyer might often offer. But what about the idea of these systems as determinations? Let's go back to Brazil with their backlog of 80 million cases. These cases, or most of them, will never be sorted out by lawyers and courts. But here's a better idea, perhaps, or a different idea. You could have a system and say to parties, your case will not be heard by lawyers and courts in the foreseeable future, but we have a system that can predict how our courts would almost certainly decide your case based on lots of patch cases. And you could ask the parties, would you be willing to accept that prediction of the court by the court, by the system? Would you be willing to accept that prediction as a binding determination of the court? If the system perhaps has a degree of confidence of 95% or higher. So it's not a human decision, but it's a determination made really on the basis of a prediction of how the court has behaved in the past. Now, I know there's problems about these systems based on machine learning, not being able to explain their lines of reasoning, and people also worry about bias within the systems. But I put this forward as a thought experiment that some of our problems in the future might be solved through AI. The fifth future element I want to discuss with you is dispute avoidance. I call this putting a fence at the top of the cliff rather than an ambulance at the bottom, because that's what most people want. And just as in medicine, we've moved to preventative medicine, we've moved to public health as well as clinical health, we need in law and courts to move to preventative legal work, to putting that fence at the top of the cliff. And that will reduce, in my view, the number of cases likely to go forward to the courts. So there are the five ideas, asynchronous online judging, the extended court, the idea of a front end, artificial intelligence, and dispute avoidance. But what about justice? Well, I wrote, when I was in Oxford, I taught jurisprudence, legal philosophy. Justice matters to me. My only interest in this context is increasing access to justice. But I do accept that there are, for many people, many concerns. Judges without courtrooms, justice without lawyers, and what I've noticed, and this is very strange, is that both critics and supporters of online courts use the language of justice. Supporters say these systems will increase access to justice, and those who criticize say that it will be an affront to justice. So I've done some analysis in my book of the various forms of justice that are at issue here. And I've identified seven forms of justice that any court system should meet. Our systems, whether or not they're physical or whether or not they are online, 
should deliver substantive justice, by which I mean fair decisions. They should deliver procedural justice, fair process. They should deliver open justice, transparency. They should deliver distributive justice. That is to say, they are accessible to all. Proportionate justice, that the cost and the effort is somehow appropriately balanced by reference to the nature of the case. Enforceable justice, that the output is backed by the coercive powers of the state. And sustainable justice, that whatever court system we have in place, whether physical or technological, is sufficiently resourced. And my view and my analysis is that for some cases, but not all of cases, online courts meet these seven criteria better than our existing system. Now, many lawyers and judges, of course, point to the perfect court system, the wonderful oral hearing, the superb judges, the, um, the amazing lawyers, and say, that's what we should be comparing online courts with. I disagree. I think we should be comparing online courts with the reality. And the reality is because of COVID, our physical courts have shut. Because of COVID, our backlog is enormous. And for decades, we have had an access to justice problem. Lawyers and judges can talk endlessly about how great court systems are. But as long as more than half the world is excluded, and in, even in advanced court systems, courts are too expensive, and too time consuming and too forbidding, we have to change. And so I say that if the key issue here, if your concern is genuinely access to justice, is not whether or not online courts will replace traditional courts or which are the two are superior, it's whether online courts can take on some of the work that traditional courts do not or cannot. Let me repeat that, the key issue if your concern is genuinely access to justice, is not whether or not online courts will replace traditional courts or which are better, it is whether online courts can take on some of the work that traditional courts do not or cannot. And my point here is that in the name of justice, many critics are missing the chance radically to reduce injustice. Now, I appreciate and have done for 40 years that many lawyers are nervous about technology. But I often give the same message that I give to doctors. I say to doctors that patients don't want doctors, they want health. And similarly, I don't believe that people want courts or judges or lawyers. They want the outcomes that courts and lawyers and judges bring. So our challenge is to think, are there new, better, quicker, cheaper, easier ways of delivering the outcome of a system we have had in place in some cases for many centuries? We have to open our minds as many other industries and sectors have done to new ways of delivering court service. We have to open our minds to new ways of delivering access to justice. We have to rid ourselves of the idea that tomorrow's court system is simply an automated version of today's court system. I close, ladies and gentlemen, with a quotation from a man called Sil from Silicon Valley called Alan Kay. He once said, that the best way to predict the future is to invent it. Now, I've been invited along today to predict the future and I'm honored and privileged to have tried to do so. But the challenge is not for me to predict, it's for you, the decision makers, the opinion formers, the policy makers, the judges, the lawyers, the technologists, to make this a reality. So the question I ask is not of me, what does the future look like? It's of you, what future are you going to invent? Thank you very much indeed for listening. Richard, I uh, thank you very much. It was, uh, well, a very um, eye provocative and uh, um, wonderful uh, um, um, talk, speech, whatever. Uh, I follow every word you just said. 
And uh, I would say I'm, uh, I'm a journalist. My profession is I'm a newscaster, but I'm a journalist. So, and I, I also used to say that people really don't need journalists. They need news. They need uh, accurate information. They need uh, to, um, uh, to know who are telling them the, the news, the information, the uh, accurate information they need. Uh, uh, and this became also very, very important uh, for the last uh, years, I would say, in most of the world. Um, if uh, I may take a little bit of your time and your uh, availability, uh, uh, le let, me, uh, let me try to, um, to, to ask your um, development on, on this idea. We are in the middle of something, a revolution, uh, chaos, uh, whatever. Uh, the needs, uh, the people needs, the, they, they don't get the, the response they, they, they need in, uh, in the time they need. But the, the change on the judicial system or, or, or how the courts work, it's not a question, uh, I th assume from your uh, words, it's not a, a question of fine-tuning the system. It's a uh, 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 much broader uh, reset, not an, an absolute reset, but a broader, a wider reset of the processes uh, we are used to use in justice, is it? That's absolutely right. And to use your example of newspapers, for example, of course we've seen automation that some newspapers are now visible on your iPad or your iPhone. But what's fundamentally changed, whether or not one likes it, is the advent of social media as the dominant mechanism by which it is that people obtain access to news. If you have a look in the music industry, we no longer or very seldom buy CDs. We do not buy physical objects. Uh, we have a very complex process that most people don't understand, where we subscribe to a service that in some way, somewhere, repays the providers. These are not changes at the edges of the news industry and the music industry. They're a fundamental transformation. And you are absolutely right that I'm calling for the same in law. I do not think that access to justice problem can be sufficiently met just by fine tuning and streamlining. We need to start with a blank sheet of paper. We need to rethink how it is we help people understand and enforce their legal entitlements. Okay, and there's uh, uh, another or two uh, issues I would like to have your opinion uh, on. Uh, I would say that uh, um, the the first one, and this may sound silly, but it's a problem I'm facing for the last four or five days. And um, it, 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 well, I, th I think it uh, converges uh, with uh, some of the um, characteristics and uh, issues you mentioned in your speech. Well, my problem is uh, my family profile in my Uber account vanished. And that's a problem for me because that's my, uh, how my 15 years old uh, son um, goes from school back home and uh, whatever. And uh, I'm uh, struggling for the last five days trying to reach out someone, some representative from the company uh, because all the help is online and on the app. But everything they told me, they tell me to do, it's, the, those options are not available. I don't know what happened. And it's impossible to reach uh, by phone or physically um, some representative of the company. So this is a problem for justice, even if it's in a very, very small uh, scale. But we face this kind of problems every day. And these problems, uh, they, uh, they bring us uh, some issues about uh, uh, IA and uh, the data processing and mining and uh, how uh, machine learning, robotics, uh, digitalization 
uh, handles people's problems. And this is already a problem of justice and law, probably. Yes, I, I sympathize with you with the, the dependency on Uber, but in a way it's a, a case study if we are increasingly dependent on online systems and services, we have to be sure that the support services are accessible and intelligible. And what a lot of people have been working on over the, the last few years is the idea of design thinking or user-centered design. When you build a system with the end users in mind. So that's to say we need a court system that's designed for not by lawyers and judges, for lawyers and judges, but for ordinary people. And we have to make sure that the support is there in the forms they need. Some people will be happy with online support and others, there should be other sorts of support, perhaps by video, uh, where they can speak to another human being. We have to design our systems with users in mind. Your challenge there for me is not, I don't think, a reason not to move forward at all. It's to move forward in a way that takes sensible account of what users require. So it's a, it's a crucial point and it requires investment because very often the people who lose out when insufficient investment is made is the end user. Often even in the world of training end users, which is, uh, is something again can be done online. But we need systems that are intuitive, that people can use easily. And when there are problems, there are other people or tools available readily and at no cost. Richard, uh, thank you very, very much uh, for your time, for your uh, ideas, for sharing them with us. It was really a pleasure listening to you and uh, um, uh, beginning to think. Uh, I'm not from the judicial system myself, so uh, I'm a citizen. Uh, and uh, it was very, very um, uh, interesting for me to hear what you just said to all of our uh, audience uh, spreading um, all around the world, but mainly in Europe uh, at this uh, high level conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure and privilege. And Okay. Richard, thank you very much. It was our Sorry, privilege. Uh, uh, there, was, there was some interference. Just wanted to say it was a, a great pleasure and privilege to, to be with you. Uh, I wish you well for the rest of the event on this crucial subject. Thank you very much. Thank you very much once again.